Welcome to the Q2 2024 earnings call. My name is Brianna and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you have a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. As a reminder, the conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Alicia Charity. Alicia, you may begin. Thank you, operator, and good morning. Welcome to Ameriprise Financial's second quarter earnings call. On the call with me today are Jim Caracciolo, Chairman and CEO, and Walter Berman, Chief Financial Officer. Following their remarks, we'd be happy to take your questions. Turning to our earnings presentation materials that are available on our website, on slide two you will see a discussion of forward-looking statements. Specifically, during the call, you will hear reference to various non-GAAP financial measures, which we believe provide insight into the company operations. Reconciliation of non-GAAP numbers to their respective GAAP numbers can be found in today's materials and on our website. Some statements that we make on this call may be forward-looking, reflecting management's expectations about future events and overall operating plans and performance. These forward-looking statements speak only as of today's date and involve a number of risks and uncertainties. A sample list of factors and risks that could cause actual results to be materially different from forward-looking statements can be found in our second quarter 2024 earnings release, our 2023 annual report to shareholders, and our 2023 10-K report. We make no obligation to publicly update or revise these forward-looking statements. On slide three, you see our GAAP financial results at the top of the page for the second quarter. Below that, you see our adjusted operating results, which management believes enhances the understanding of our business by reflecting the underlying performance of our core operations and facilitates a more meaningful trend analysis. Many of the comments that management makes on the call today will focus on adjusted operating results. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Good morning, everyone. As you saw in our release, Ameriprise delivered another strong quarter and first half of the year, continuing our record of delivering strong operating results over many years in operating environments. Looking at the external landscape in the quarter, markets continue to be good with the expectation that there will be a soft landing. While inflation remains sticky, people assume that it's going to come down. However, that could take longer than expected. And there is also the ongoing geopolitical instability and the upcoming U.S. election. So all of this is top of mind for our clients. With that as a backdrop, our second quarter results were excellent. In terms of our operating results, revenues were up 9% from positive business results and markets and, in fact, reached a new record of $4.2 billion. Earnings were also excellent, with EPS, excluding disclosed severance costs, increasing 17% to $8.72. This is also a new high. We also generated free cash flow of 90% and returned another $693 million to shareholders. And our return on equity was nearly 50% and continues to be best in class. Our assets under management and administration were $1.4 trillion, up 12% year over year, with good client net inflows and market appreciation. We have also been adept at maintaining a significant investment agenda that is complemented by a strong reengineering discipline for reinvestment. We freed up additional resources, which is why you're seeing some additional severance costs in the quarter that we will benefit from through the year. In fact, G&A was down 2%, excluding those one-time costs. In wealth management, we're building on what we know works, quality engagement centered on advice and delivered through the Ameriprise client experience. Client satisfaction remains excellent at 4.9 out of 5 stars, and we continue to receive important industry accolades. Total client assets and wealth management were strong at $972 billion, up 17%. We're also attracting new clients in the $500,000 to $5 million range. Our most recent research underscores that our premium client value proposition continues to appeal to people who want to work with a trusted advisor and a trusted firm like Ameriprise in an advice relationship. 
For the quarter, total client wrap assets reached $535 billion, an increase of 18%. Wrap flows also grew nicely, up 34% year over year to $7.5 billion. And transactional activity was also up, increasing 19% from a year ago. Cash balances, though still at a higher level, are beginning to shift back to wrap and other products which represent a future growth opportunity for us. We continue to provide exceptional support and capabilities to our advisors. Both satisfaction and growth remain excellent. Productivity increased another 11% to 968,000 in the quarter. We're focused on leveraging our integrated and effective CRM, engagement tools, and digital capabilities for client deepening and acquisition to complement in-person interactions. We're also using automation and analytics to drive efficiency, helping advisors enhance personalization based on client needs and identifying new growth opportunities. Our advisor force grew to nearly 10,400 in the quarter. We added another 52 experienced advisors and we feel good about our pipeline as well as our differentiated value proposition. At Ameriprise, total assets were up year over year, and we closed the quarter at $23 billion. Strong contributions from bank earnings drove a nice increase in net investment income. We continue to have good advisor and client interest in lending with notable growth in pledge loan volumes as our advisors engage their clients in our banking solutions. During the quarter, I spent time with the top 10% of our advisor force at our largest recognition conference. They appreciate what we built together and that Ameriprise is not just another firm or group of practices, but that we have a supportive and caring culture that helps them have highly successful practices. And our retirement protection business is a consistent contributor to our positive results. As our advisors provide more advice, they're appropriately incorporating annuity and insurance solutions to serve clients' complex needs. We're driving good sales in our targeted areas. For example, structured annuity sales are up 60% from a year ago, and in insurance, VUL sales are up 24%. RPS continues to add nicely to our overall earnings and free cash flow, and we continue to feel very good about our product mix and position. In asset management, clearly the active industry remains dynamic. Our team remains focused on client needs and generating attractive investment performance. Total assets under management increased 4% to $642 billion as market appreciation more than offset net outflows. We continue to have good investment performance across asset classes and time periods. Globally, 68% of our funds are above the median for the three-year period on an asset-weighted basis, with nearly 80% for five years and 90% for 10 years. We also have 114 four- and five-star Morningstar-rated funds globally. Turning to flows, total outflows were $4 billion, improving $1.3 billion from a year ago, excluding the legacy insurance partner asset transfer, which came through both in retail and institutional channels. In retail overall, we had improvement in gross sales up $1 billion from last year, with a slight improvement in redemptions. Though we're in net outflows, our equity results are outpacing the industry, and we see an opportunity to gain more flows and fixed income. Institutional flows were slightly positive in the quarter, driven primarily from wins in the APAC region. And we're putting additional emphasis on models, SMAs, and ETFs and beginning to gain traction. We continue to focus on transforming our global asset management business to gain greater operational efficiencies, leveraging resources and technology globally. You saw that our G&A expenses decreased 6% in the quarter, and we have a number of additional actions underway to further derive benefits throughout the year. In asset management, we're maintaining good fee levels and good margins. At Ameriprise, our model and overall firm has enabled us to perform very well over market and environmental cycles. We continue to leverage our global capabilities as well as steadily invest in technology, digital, analytics, AI, products and solutions across our complementary businesses. And in June, we officially recognized our 130th anniversary, and we're one of a select number of public companies with this legacy of success and performance. Our ROE of 50% is consistently among the best. Ameriprise has been the number one performer for TSR, 
among the S&P 500 financials since our spinoff in 2005. And we continue to deliver excellent returns and returns to shareholders in a significant way. Looking forward, we have the right strategic focus, growth investments, a talented team, and a meaningful opportunity to drive greater growth. Now, Walter will provide additional color on our financials. Walter? Thank you, Jim. Adjusted operating EPS grew 17% to $8.72, adjusted for $0.19 cents of severance expense associated with the company's reengineering initiatives reflecting earnings growth across all of our businesses. The diversified nature of our businesses drive our consistent financial performance across market cycles and sets us apart from most in the financial services industry. Assets under management administrations increased 12% to $1.4 trillion, benefiting from strong client flows over the past year and equity market appreciation. This has resulted in strong 90% revenue growth across our businesses. As you know, we continue to manage expenses tightly to maintain strong margins. G&A expenses were down 2%, excluding severance expenses demonstrating our continued focus on re-engineering and operational transformation. We continue to selectively invest in areas that will drive future business growth, particularly in wealth management. We will maintain our expense discipline in 2024 to achieve growth and shareholder objectives. Our returns remain strong with a consolidated margin of 27.4%, excluding severance expenses, and a best-in-class return on, of equity of 50%. Balance sheet fundamentals, including excess capital and liquidity, remain very strong. Our diversified business model benefits from significant and stable 90% free cash flow contribution across all business segments. We returned $693 million of capital to shareholders in the quarter. In 2024, we continue to expect to return 80% of operating earnings to shareholders. On slide six, you'll see the strong results from wealth management. Client and wrap assets increased 17 and 18% respectively from strong net flows and market appreciation over the past year. Wrap flows were strong in the quarter at 7.5 billion or 6% annualized flow rate. In the quarter, adjusted operating net revenues increased 13% to $2.6 billion from growth in client assets, increased transactional activity, and 11% increase in net investment income in the bank. This drove revenue per advisor to a new high of $968,000, up 11% from a year ago. Total cash balances, including third-party money market funds and brokered CDs, were $81.9 billion, which was over 8% of clients' assets. As clients remain heavily concentrated in yield-oriented products, with highly liquid products like money market funds being more in favor than term products like certificates and brokered CDs. We are beginning to see clients put money back to work in wrap and other products on our platform, and we expect this to continue over time as markets and rates normalize, which creates a significant opportunity. Cash balances excluding money market funds and brokered CDs were $40.6 billion, driven by normal seasonal tax patterns and the transition of cash related to Comerica partnership in other products. Underlying cash sweep was stable in the quarter, as expected, and that trend continues in July. I want to provide some additional perspective on sweep cash. A cash sweep is a transaction account for money in motion that is in between investments or for cash to pay fees, which is similar to a bank checking account. Cash sweep is not meant to be an investment option for significant cash balances over extended periods. We have a broad range of higher yielding products available for a client seeking to hold cash over extended periods, which is where a large portion of the excess cash has gone. As a result, our clients generally have very low cash sweep balances, which are now approximately $6,000 on average. At this point, we do not anticipate any changes in our approach to cash sweep. Adjusted operating expenses in the quarter increased 
with distribution expenses of 17%, reflecting business growth, including Comerica and increased transactional activity. G&A expenses were flat at $409 million, reflecting investments for business growth offset by reengineering initiatives. This combination of revenue growth and well-managed expenses resulted in the business sustaining an operating margin of 31%. Turning to asset management on slide 7, financial results were very strong in the quarter, and we continue to manage the business well through a challenging environment for active asset management. Total AUM increased 4% to $642 billion, primarily from higher equity market appreciation, partially offset by net outflows. In the quarter, operating earnings increased 35% to $218 million as a result of equity market appreciation and discipline expense management, which more than offset the cumulative impact of net outflows. And margin was 38%, reflecting strong market appreciation and expense discipline. Adjusted operating expenses decreased 2%, with general and administrative expenses down 6% from a year ago, reflecting the benefits from comprehensive expense management initiatives taken to date. We're looking globally, especially in EMEA, to enhance operating efficiency and manage expenses so we are well positioned going forward. Let's turn to slide eight. Retirement protection solutions continue to deliver good earnings and free cash flow generation, reflecting the high quality of the business that has been built over a long period of time. Pre-tax adjusted operating earnings in the quarter increased 4%, to $196 million, reflecting the benefit from strong markets and higher interest rates partially offset by higher distribution expenses associated with strong sales levels. Overall, retirement and protection solutions sales improved in the quarter, with protection sales up 21% to $93 million, primarily in higher margin BUL products. Variable annuity sales grew 45% to $1.4 billion, with strong momentum in our structured product. Turning to the balance sheet on slide 9, balance sheet fundamentals and free cash flow generation remain strong with growth in excess capital to $1.7 billion. We have diverse sources of dividends from all our businesses enabled by strong underlying fundamentals. This supports our ability to consistently return capital to shareholders and invest for future business growth. In the last year, we returned $2.6 billion of capital to shareholders, including $693 million in a quarter. Ameriprise's consistent capital return drives long-term shareholder value. Now let's finish with slide 10. Ameriprise delivered excellent growth in the second quarter, which is a continuation of our long track record across market cycles and our commitment to profitable growth. Over the last 12 months, revenues grew 10%. Earnings per share increased 15%. ROE grew 90 basis points, excluding unlocking and we returned $2.6 billion of capital to shareholders. We had similar growth trends over the past five years, with 7% revenue growth, 16% EPS compound annual growth, return on equity improvement nearly 13 percentage points, and we returned $11.9 billion of capital to shareholders. These trends are consistent over the longer term as well. Compared to most financial services companies, This differentiated performance across multiple cycles speaks to the complementary nature of our business mix, as well as our focus on profitable growth. With that, we'll take your question. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press star 1. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Sanit Kamath from Jeffries is online with your first question. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I wanted to start with the cash sweep uh, commentary, Walter. So it, it doesn't sound like you're planning on making any big changes, but I know in the past you've said that's always subject to the competitive environment. Obviously, we've seen a handful of companies uh, take some actions on their uh, cash sweep uh, rate. So I guess the question is, I'm trying to reconcile those two. Is it that the moves that those peers are making are sort of catching up to you, or is your sort of client account size different that you're just not experiencing the same need to uh, to make those changes? Well, okay, thanks. And uh, I guess let me start. We, as you know, we operate within regulatory and fiduciary standards. I, 
and therefore we feel uh, certainly uh, looking at sweep and as transactional assets or cash and motions, it, it's totally appropriate and aligned. I can't really comment on what is uh, what's taking place with the wirehouses. I don't understand it. I really, I think we, uh, it. All I know is what we do from that standpoint, and all the actions we have taken to ensure that the money is in sweep is really for transactional purposes, and it's at the levels you know that we the majority of it is. Uh, is in under 100,000. The account balances are under $6,000. The rate, our rates are competitive, and uh, and we keep the appropriate level of cash that we think is necessary to operate. So uh, that is the focus of us, and we feel very comfortable with that. And obviously, we'll evaluate things as it goes. But we we looking at what we have today, we think it's totally appropriate. Got it. Okay. And then um, just another one on the bank. So I think uh, maybe at the fourth quarter call, Walter, you said you expected bank NII would be higher in 24 than 23, uh, which seems to be the case year to date. Uh, But then you also made a comment about 25. Um, Just wondering if you think that you could continue to see bank NII growth as we move into 25 over 24 and maybe unpack some of the underlying drivers. Thanks. As I remember what I said, clearly uh, 24 over 23, but uh, I still believe, you know, the tra- it was slow, but yes, but the net, net interest income should be higher. Yes, uh, that statement I think is still valid. And the, and the drivers there? Well, the driver is, is obviously we're investing over 6%, and so we, we feel that, that uh, as maturities and our short duration, that it will give us that, and we, uh, that momentum. And we are adding, but we're obviously being measured, but we're adding. Got it. Okay, thanks. Ryan Kruger with KBW is on with your next question. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Um, first one was just, can can you disclose um, how much of your client cash is specifically held in your RAP advisory accounts? It's about $12 billion. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. And then... Um, I guess the, another question was just on recruiting. Um, your, you know, your experienced recruits that you know have slowed down a bit year to date. Can you comment on you know what you're seeing from a competitive environment for hiring experienced advisors and um, and just kind of any any thoughts on on why the slowdown and your your expectations for the rest of the year? Yeah, we we sort of uh, again um, a bit of a slowdown as we you know into the second quarter. You know, we can't tell you exactly why it looks like people would stay and put a little bit uh, based on good, you know markets, et cetera, and moving into the the, the you know I guess into the seasonal. Um, we we see a good pickup in our pipeline again, um, and so we we think that will improve as we go forward. Uh, but, you know, other than that, um, speaking to the team, that's really what they, they saw. Okay, great. Thank you. Alex Blostein from Goldman Sachs is online with your next question. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, so I wanted to uh, go back to your comments regarding clients starting to put capital to work or money to work uh, in rapid. We saw those net flows pick up a little bit. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where the cash is coming from? Is it ultimately coming out of the kind of forty forty one billion dollar balance uh, that currently sits in sweep and your certificates business, or uh, is this coming out from other sources kind of like money market funds that sit off balance sheet or outside of the sweep program and maybe just remind us how much cash ultimately is still on the sidelines outside of that forty forty one billion dollar number so the if I understand, Alex, uh, your question is about, I think our total cash is about 80 to $81 billion, uh, and so therefore uh, in the money markets and in uh, third-party CDs is about 40 some billion dollars. And we are seeing that certainly money is still coming into, uh, I would say, uh, money markets, third-party third money markets, and but it's and slowed a little on the CD side. And uh, so uh, from that standpoint, there is we are seeing less in CDs and there is a shift. Uh, people are staying shorter uh, from that standpoint as they're trying to take advantage on the yield curve. That's the trend that we're, we're seeing about now. Gotcha. I, I guess what I'm trying to get to it is clients re-risk and extend duration and put capital to work, which you capture those economics in your rep program, which is great. Uh, but should we expect that to put any pressure on the 
40 billion dollar balance across sort of sweep and your certificates business or could that remain fairly stable as money comes out of other forms of kind of cash options that's a good question uh, we do anticipate because obviously uh from an economic standpoint that would be beneficial to us uh, we had new money go in there and yes as it gets redeployed uh that would be beneficial and we think that was uh, oh, certainly will be a source of the repositioning Okay, gotcha. Um, and then quick follow up. So GNA really well managed. Um, I think if you look at this quarter, um, excluding severance, I think you're at like 910 million or something like that uh, for Q2. Um, how should you uh, sort of think about GNA evolving through the rest of the year? And I know you highlighted a number of so kind of savings programs uh, that you continue to to sort of find. Um, so maybe any sort of early thoughts on your 2025 GNA outlook would be helpful. Thank you. <laughs> oh, listen, uh, on 25, uh, I can say that we're, we feel certainly we're, uh, the expenses are being well managed, and certainly as we reposition and look at our process changes and number of efficiencies that we're getting there. So I think I uh, feel comfortable, as we said, for 24. Uh, 25 we certainly will continue. Uh, we're going to be investing in the business. So uh, I would say you'll, you should see well managed expenses, but we are going to be investing for growth also. Okay. I think Thank you. Part of the way uh, you certainly have seen, we've operated in, in prior years, and certainly, especially in '24, we just, it, it's we ma- we manage uh, our expenses in proportion to our revenue and, and manage our margin. Yeah, I got you. Okay, great. Thanks, Walt. Brennan Hawken with UBS is online with your next question. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, Curious to drill down a little bit on the $12 billion of sweep within um, uh, advisory accounts. So do do you know what portion of that $12 billion um, would include Ameriprise as a uh, fiduciary or investment advisor? You know, so so a little more specifically, you know, what portion of that $12 billion would be in the employee channel and in any uh, portfolios where... Um, Ameriprise, you know, with centrally managed or, or uh, central models, where uh, Ameriprise is the advisor. A lot of our, oh, go, go. a lot of our central models um, are really run by outside managers, institutional, and um, oversighted there. So, and again, even in those type of models, there's roughly around two percent or so. Um, and even in our advisor discretion, it's actually less than on the institutional models. So I would probably say, you know, as you look at it, now we haven't broken that out between, you know, employee, non-employee, et cetera, because it's, these models are all uh, run in certain ways. Uh, but, you know, it is, uh, as Walt has said, a very low balance. It's less than like 2% or so. Uh, and there is constant trading activities, fees being pulled, uh, foreign taxes being paid, things like that. So it's not as though this – and a lot of the actual cash, if there's any higher balance, uh, whether institutional or otherwise, they are moved into money markets and other short-duration products uh, as well. So that's, that's how we, we look at it and manage it. Um, and that has been appropriate. We disclosed that very clearly. Uh, and from a compliance and legal perspective, we feel very comfortable with what that is. Great. Thanks for that color, Jim. Uh, and then you spoke to in- increased engagement in your banking offering. And, and we've heard some firms, uh, some competitor firms of yours note that we may be seeing the beginning of improvement in pledge loan growth. So curious whether you're seeing that or or perhaps even just early signs of that? Yeah, so we saw nice increases in our pledge loan as we, again, go through the year. Um, We will be um, launching um, another uh, fixed rate one, uh, which we know has been popular out in the industry. So um, that will be coming on board over the next quarter or so. Um, We've also seen uh, some increase as we started to put some uh, direct uh, CDs and, and savings programs in for cash to come in externally from that, from our clients. Again, we're just starting that up. Uh, but, no, uh, we, we think uh, that as we launch these other products in the bank, advisors are looking for them, um, and we feel like they will, over time, 
uh, gone are both assets as, as well as we can then deal with some of the lending activities appropriate. Okay, but, but, but no specific pickup in the pledge run yet. Yes, we, we saw a nice pickup. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, do you? Um, we, got a, we, we can get it for you, but we saw a nice pickup in the quarter. Great. Thank you. Stephen Chubach with Wolf Research is online with your next question. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. So, I wanted to ask about the competitive landscape and just net new asset trends more broadly. Uh, RAP flows, as you noted, were quite strong in the quarter, certainly an encouraging sign, uh, but consolidated flows were a bit weaker. I know on the last quarter's call, you alluded to some irrational actors, just more aggressive pay packages, potentially impacting the pace of organic growth. We're just hoping we can get some sort of mark to market, any update in terms of what you're seeing on the outlook for recruitment. No, so certainly, uh, as you indicated, RAP was quite strong on the client. As, uh, they were, we, we saw both in certificates and annuities some lapsing, and, and that impacted it. And, and our, we look at our growth rates, and we certainly feel that they're aligned with the industry. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, uh, we are track, getting traction. We feel comfortable with it. And uh, so we, we see that trajectory, uh, basically, uh, we feel comfortable. Yeah, I mean, we, we looked at it. There, there was a, a little bit of a slowing, to your point, in the second quarter overall. Um, and we, we did look and say, okay, is there any in, in particular? Um, you know, outside of the, the, the usual activities, um, people just didn't add as much advisors, I guess, with the market and everything. Um, and very clearly, it looked the same way as we looked at some of the across the industry. So it wasn't like we're an outlier. No, that's helpful. And then just for my follow-up on the asset management margin, you know, despite the pressure on fees, the operating margins continue to run above target, so certainly encouraging to see. We're hoping you to speak to the margin outlook over the next few quarters, whether you believe you can sustainably run above the longer-term target of 31 to 35%, barring any negative or exogenous market shocks. Well, as you saw, um, we're maintaining um, a, a consistent, stable fee levels. Um, yes, we had some additional outflows with, um, you know, um, a very low fee basis, and we are um, adjusting our model and expense base, leveraging the technology, leveraging our global resources, et cetera, that we continue to do that helps offset any pressure that we received on, from a flow basis. Um, again, uh, barring changes in market conditions, uh, we think that we can maintain sort of a, a good uh, margin for the business uh, based on what we're doing. Uh, we are investing, so we're not cutting from areas that we, we want to grow in. As I mentioned, we're, we gain flows, even though it's in, not in the numbers we discussed to you, with models. Um, so more money has gone in there. Uh, we're starting to gain traction as well in SMAs, which we think will be good and as well in uh, ETFs. And we will be, you know, looking as we even pursue some active ETFs as we go forward. So there are things that we are doing. Um, at the same time, uh, we are trying to free up expenses and resources based on the investments we've made um, and uh, use our resources globally to get more efficiencies. Great, color. Thanks for taking my questions. Wilma Burtis from Raymond James is online with your next question. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, I know you talked a little bit about the margin, but do you think there's a lot more uh, wiggle room on expenses in the segment and asset management? Thanks. So, um, yes, we, we feel like um, as we continue, as you saw, there was additional severance we took in the second quarter. Part of that was in the asset management business. Um, and there are continued changes that we're looking to make um, and improving and tightening the way we operate with our processes and efficiencies and freeing up resources and things that aren't generating the value that we need. Um, and so uh, we are actually pursuing those things as well, and uh, uh, there will be some further adjustments as we move forward. 
I know you guys don't get asked too much about the insurance business anymore, but the, the margins seem pretty good there. Uh, it seems like you grew it a little bit in the quarter. Is that more interesting to grow at this uh, time, or how are you guys thinking about that? Thanks. Yes, yeah, so you saw good growth in the insurance and annuities, the structured instrument, and the VUL products, which are both very good products for us. Um, and actually, the reason um, there wasn't more earnings falling is because when you first booked that, you got the distribution expense up front that you're, you know, is, is the cost. So over time, the, that increase in volumes will also add to the earnings mix. Uh, we also got very good rates now as we reinvested on the investment side and the spreads there. So uh, I think the business will be a, a good, strong, consistent contributor, and a lot of that is free cash flow that we utilize for buyback. So we feel very good, and you also saw in the quarter again, even in the LTC business, that we had nice earnings there uh, as we continue to make adjustments, take rate, um, invest appropriately, and invest out. So uh, we're feeling very good about how that will add to, to the total of the company. Thomas Gallagher from Evercore ISI is online with your next question. Please go ahead. Good morning, um, Walter. Just to to come back, just a quick one on on the uh, on the cash sweep. The based on your answer to Sunit's question, it sounds like you aren't very focused on what the p big peers are doing competitively on cash sweep crediting rates. Now, now to me, that just implies you probably don't really see it as a big issue for Ameriprise either competitively, regulatory, litigation-wise. Um, is that is that a fair conclusion, or maybe you can expand a little more on that? Uh, okay. So the question is: is I don't understand what the drivers are. We certainly understand their rates, and we, it is part of an evaluation that we go through. So that that was all you should read into what I was saying. Uh, certainly, we evaluated uh, from a competitive element as we look at it, but it is uh, I, I just can't comment on some of the drivers or, or the elements that are creating what to change is for. Yeah, and, and Tom, you know, as we look at it again, we have very low um, balance, a very low percentage, and particularly in um, the wrap that is there. Uh, we do see the, the money, true transactions and fees. So you don't want to go where you don't have it or selling a security, you know, at the same time you do, you're pulling on some of these things or, or clearing. So um, we look at institutional accounts, it's the same thing. So um, we're not exactly sure what the changes uh, from the wirehouse, et cetera. Uh, but again, um, until we know anything different, we, we feel very comfortable and uh, from a competitive frame, the same way. I mean, this is not money. We, we have a lot of different places where um, our advisors move money to, um, and same thing with models. Uh, and the money, if it is positional, is in those um, other type of earning assets rather than we keep it in sweep. Yeah, and the one proof point, again, which really, uh, we're under $6,000, and if you look at the industry there between 10 and 15, so it please it's it we have just less act, um, levels there because it's strictly used for cash emotion. And you uh, you don't see any issues with the new DOL fiduciary standards related to this not nothing nothing on that front that you're focused on. We're up. No. Okay, thanks. And then just for a follow up on the RPS segment um, I guess, you know, one, one thing that strikes me is your NII has been up a lot, particularly year over year in that segment, even, even quarter over quarter, it's up a lot. The, you know, and, and Jim, I heard your point about distribution expenses and, and that is true. I mean, you could see the numbers, uh, those are, those are higher based on better sales. Um, but if you would have told me a year ago that your NII would be up as much as it would, I would have thought the run rate would have, would be a lot higher in that segment right now. So I guess my, my question is, what is going on with the other kind of components of your P&L and that business? Are, are you seeing higher mortality or disability claims? Is it the annuity earnings that have been a drag? Maybe just a little perspective on, you know, 
kind of what's really driving the the ship here because it does you know for the strength in NII um, it's a little surprising that we're not seeing more hitting the bottom line thanks well there's nothing that really stands out uh, as you look at it our disability claims are, are, are quite good and actually and, and our insurance claims are within uh, expectation so there is no one driver from that standpoint so I I I have to guess we are performing where we thought we would uh, let me take that away and just see where you know where you're driving at because I just don't see it at this stage. So let me, it's a fair point, so let me let me take a look at it and, and see what you're going, and we can get back. Okay, how's that? That would be great. Thanks, Walter. John Barnage from Piper Sandler is online with your next question. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. You called out the election in your comments. Uh, can you? Talk about how you're expecting that to impact operations and planning for such. I can imagine it can impact some asset management product demand, but do you think it has an impact on advisor recruitment or how you think about marketing expense? Thank you. No, well, I think it's more from a client perspective, right? Um, so clients want to understand a bit better what does it mean based on who gets in, what policies, how it would affect investments. I think you can hear that even from, you know, market pundits you know, speaking on the, in the airwaves. So, again, that, that's always a top of mind triggered by those types of things that they hear. So we provide market strategies. We look at what the implications of changes in policy may be or what type of investments appropriate. Um, and so that's more of where it is. Now, how does that work with advisors? It depends on how clients are. You know, if they, they feel like more comfortable, then they'll put more money to work. And the same thing with the advisor. If they feel a little bit that there will be a, a change or implications, they'll, they'll hold. I don't, at this point, I don't see fundamentally anything, you know, driving it in a major way. But as you get closer to the election and there's more conversations, I, I think, you know, and that, that's what we usually see before an election. I don't think it fundamentally changes it. Um, but you do see, you know, based on who gets in and whether policy changes, whether there are impacts as far as in what people invest or what they rotate out of. Thank you for that answer. Uh, my follow-up question, can you talk about some examples of leveraging the global operational efficiencies for the asset management business in a way maybe you were not previously doing so? Thank you. Yes. So when I talk, we, we spent a lot of time and energy you know, as an example of integrating um, the BMO acquisition with Threadneedle, but also putting them on global platforms that we have, you know, our, our, our global trading platform or, you know, uh, uh, ensuring that we have the right attribution across, how we leveraging research, all those various things. Um, and, and with that, we feel like we can now move the people and the processes to operate more consistently, get more efficiencies, where we locate the resources, whether we have them in the U.S., we have some in Europe, we have them in India, et cetera. So we, we look at that as well uh, to drive efficiencies. And, and then with that, we really want to ensure that we are um, leveraging the technology more fully. Um, and so that, those are the things that we're doing as we look across. Uh, you know, sometimes because of the overlaps, like we had a lot of overlaps because of the BMO acquisition, with what we had in place, we couldn't really do that until the technology, until the legal entities, until all of the human resources were uh, dealt with appropriately. And so now there's another opportunity for us to further streamline that and get some further efficiencies from that. Is that helpful to you? It is indeed, thank you very much. Michael Cypress from Morgan Stanley is online with your next question. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. Just wanted to circle back to the cash sweep commentary, just hoping you could clarify for us uh, how and to what extent are advisors compensated on cash sweep balances. And more broadly there, just given some of the industry movements and understand your, your, your commentary and views there, but just curious more broadly how you see the scope over time for the way customers pay for services to evolve and potentially over time move away from sweep. And in that draconian scenario or scenario over time plays out where economics and things shift. Just curious how uh, you might be able to continue to capture economics. What are other ways that customers could pay for services? Well, again, as I said, um, you know, 
where, wherever you you are, you have transactional activity that you want to settle, and you want to you have to do that timely, right? You don't want to put people on margin. You don't want to uh, draw out of uh, other securities at the wrong time. So there's always a certain low level of cash. Now, what we really do is monitor and. If cash is in any account at a larger level, that we really look for it to be moved. Um, and so, as you saw, as people moved out of some fixed income instruments or were um, leery of putting further into the market, they did invest in a lot of cash instruments, money markets, CDs, various other short-term duration fixed. Um, and so we saw that occurring, the reality of it, and actually the sweep actually went lower rather than increase. And so that's the same thing in all of the uh, RAP and institutional. Now, within that, if there is more money sitting in that, that account, we don't want that cash to be a high balance, even if it's invested out, because that's not the purpose of the RAP account. But in so doing, if there is positional cash and they're in earning instruments, then the advisors do get paid, et cetera. But again, that's something that's monitored, um, and we feel very comfortable with it. Uh, so uh, as far as the future is concerned, there's always adjustments uh, that will occur in, in pricing and, and what you would have to do to offset some of the cost of your services that we will constantly look at. Uh, but if you're asking in the near term, uh, we feel very good about where that is right now. We're not exactly sure what some of the changes that some people are bringing in about for what reasons. So I'm not sure that was as clear as it, you know, maybe to you, but it wasn't to us. Great. And then just a, a follow-up question uh, on the asset management uh, business. I was hoping you could elaborate a bit on some of the wins you referenced in the APAC region, and maybe you can elaborate on that and remind us of your footprint in APAC uh, and where you see some of the best opportunities there as you look out over the next couple of years, just in terms of countries there and, and strategies. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, we mainly we, we have a small – wholesaling, you know, working with private banks, et cetera, in the region, but a lot of it's more institutional basis. And it's against, as you would imagine, some of the, the core products we have both in Europe, um, in equities as an example, or in uh, the U.S., and in, in maybe even things like our, you know, uh, fixed income, investment grade, various things like that. So uh, we've been gaining some traction there. Same thing, um, a bit more uh, that we're seeing as potential opportunities uh, in our real estate. So uh, those are the things that we 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 have on the way. Um, you know, we recently uh, expanded a little bit in in Japan. Um, you know, we're in Korea and places like that, Singapore, uh, Australia. So there are different places where we are getting it, mainly from you know larger institutions. Uh, from some pension funds, some uh, sovereign wealth, things like that. Great. Thank you. We have no further questions at this time. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.